sustain my voice, so they didn't really care how I did it, but they wanted to read what I was going to write. So I packed two bags, and I gave the rest of my possessions away to charity, um, and I made 20 fiery playlists full of Drake, basically, and left home trying not to think about failure. Um, so we all spent our childhoods, and this is Edinburgh, where I'm from. It's um, pretty. And we spent our childhoods being told by many games enthusiast publications that games should be for the player, should serve the player, they're for us, for we the consumer, the people, um, and they're toys for grown-ups, and we sort of snatch them greedily from our makers. The game journalists in the 90s too enthusiastically embraced the idea that they were consumers, that they just wanted to buy all the shit that was marketed to them. Um, but the problem with that is that marketing seemed and still seems awfully in tune with what the consumer wants. It's almost like they have a handle on telling us what we want, basically. It's like they can shape it. And that has slowly made many publisher-backed developers sort of slaves to marketing at crunch time and long hours floated on their love of the media but never really seeing their families. So it wasn't always like this. Um, perhaps one of the most beautiful things about knowing I'm Scottish is that the bedroom coding was strong. And it was a strong and secret trade in my home country when I was a child. Um, so, this is uh, Les Eventis on the left, and um, I think that's Sanders on the right. Um, though I had no idea at the time, I was surrounded by people like Les Eventis, who was programming away in his bedroom in Aberdeenshire, and who later become one of the progenitors of Grand Theft Auto. So, Leslie um, later became my boss of Rockstar Games. And I worked in an office with John White and others who had worked on Lemmings, which is something I played when I was a kid, um, when they just started out. Um, they made Lemmings. And I think of my childhood in Scotland um, as like being surrounded by people who practiced their magic in kind of in secret before we perceived that game developers could even be these kind of gods who could create worlds of their own. Um, the bedroom coders didn't really have a player base. They had no company or stakeholders. They made games for the pure pleasure of it. They wanted to experiment, they wanted to express themselves in that kind of wild west. Um, they wanted to make, make for the pleasure of making. Though later Grand Theft Auto would become one of the biggest franchises in the world, helping strap down the whole big commercial sequels we had on gamers, it came from one original beautiful little break for expression from Serving Boy programmers. And games like Chucky Egg, Dig Dug, Hover Bover, all these games that I played when I was young were all made by young people in their bedrooms, armed only by their own fascination and an idle hour. But three years ago, I wasn't aware that this was the case. I thought it had always been this way, that to quote Matthew Burns, the player was the consumer king, and developers were merely the consumer king's unfortunate children. The bedroom coders of the 80s lived in an era where the internet wasn't the distribu distribution platform that it is now, uh, a place where anyone can log in and a place where anyone can distribute. Um, so my mind was completely changed when I met Anna Atopy. Anna had decided to live a life putting out games like psychedelic, self-illustrated zines. Um, though Anna had studied at the prestigious Guildhall for a time, she shunned the big game engines and chose to make her games with free tools like Game Maker Studio and Twine, uh, a text game engine. Anna was kind of rock and roll to me. She was like punk and outrage and riot girl. Uh, she sort of singed my brain a little bit. Um, in, in one interview, my first interview in fact, she told me, I think that games need to sort, sort of be saved by themselves. Games are really exciting and interesting to me as a form, and I think it's really sad that they're being used to do, do so little and to represent such a small set of values and perspectives. I want games to be more personal. I want games to actually tell us something about the author and the people who make them. Part of that is I want more people to have, who have something to tell us about themselves to make games. I try to be present in all of my games. I try to have all of my games point back to me and say something about me. And Anna was right. Anna predicted and helped instigate one of the biggest cultural movements to have developers take back games big time. When I started out to write what I called the Embed with Games series, I didn't know what questions I'd ask or what would become important. People often ask me how I choose the people I cover, and it's a complex answer. It's heavily slanted towards my own biases. I choose people I'm interested in who are doing something new or weird. I choose people I trust in my personal space. I choose diverse people. It's often quite haphazard. In Asia, I often landed in a place with only a trusted contact to pick me up and had to seek out people to cover. The only two rules are that I don't sign any NDAs because no one gets to bind what I say, and I try not to cover too many of the traditional white dude demographic. 
Um, money and time also limited everything I did this year. Um, game developers are often busy actually making things, it turns out. Um, I thought by staying with a generation of independent game makers, I'd just be documenting life in a new way. I thought their outlook would change my mind about something, or perhaps this would me of the notion that games were only interested in violence, and it turns out most of the games I ended up covering are non-violent, or are a critique of violent systems, which wasn't deliberate. But uh, perhaps a lot of the games the creators are making are finally disinterested in systems of violence. Um, a pattern did show itself eventually. So let me take you through a few of the amazing figures from my writing. This is uh, George Buckingham, who you might see seen around here. Um, <coughs> he's, he's right here. <laughs> um, the, first, um, the first stop while I gathered my feet fairs was uh, George Buckingham and Alice O'Connor, who helped them run the London game about the wild rumpus. I think they have both visited Screen Shape before, and I think George here is giving a workshop this year. Um, both uh, um, unconventional game makers, George is working with Dickie's Fabrique on an atmospheric adventure like game Metacione. And Alice is my friend and a journalist for Rock Paper Shotgun, and he run nights every few months uh, with the help of the rest of the Wild Rockers team. Um, and I think uh, Marie is the head of that team. Um, and Wild Rumpus is uh, heavily focused on performativity and spectatorship in games. And the idea is that the player performs the games they are playing, and this is valuable as a community activity. Um, I wrote this about George at the time. You get the very strong feeling the games serve George. He makes them serve his own curiosities and then puts them in the world to observe how people interact with them. This is probably why his work is so often unconventional. George developed a game last year called Punch the Custard, where you get two bowls of custard hooked up to a circuit, and two players literally just punch into the bowl of custard over and over to see which person can do it fastest. Um, George is heavily interested in HDI, human-computer interaction. He's interested in what computers do to us. During that January, George and Alice had nowhere for me to stay, so I had to share Alice's single bed with her every, every night. And often we would talk very late into the night about identity and belonging and how to make things that serve you. Uh, this is Alice. That's her butt. I don't think she would mind. Um, this is what I wrote by Alice. Uh, this is the only place that has ever felt like home to her. She used to sleep in a room that was a three-way for the rest of her family, no door, feeling like she was intruding on other space constantly. This is the only place where she's felt like she belonged, where she is now creating things that make her happy. She told me that she loves feeling useful in a practical way. Writing video game news on the intangible internet for five years has made her crave physically helping others. She is excited by the prospect of being needed and of making things. I lay transfixed by the wall in her body, my own smile and her happiness, hugging myself. In London, I also came across Holly Comanzio. Holly Comanzio, someone with more experience in real world games, analog games, tells me she thinks of what action she wants the players to perform and then works backwards. So she is the opposite of George. She thinks of an enjoyable or silly performance or spectacle and then reverse engineers it. So George makes something experimental to almost record what sort of reaction is made. But Holly knows the outcome and structures her games appropriately. Um, and this is uh, Carlos Monja. In February, Carlos Monja from the Fulbright Company came to the north of England and I traveled around with her for weeks, getting sleepy in the rough, rough English weather. And Carla is naturally a quiet, thoughtful, and delightfully sarcastic person. She took a while to really open up, but she, um, but eventually when we were sat in a diner in London, moving around talking about her colleague Steve Gaynor, I wrote about her. Gone home developer Carla Samanja is yelling at me over a glass of rosé wine in a boozy backstreet diner, the kind where everyone spits their late night accounting frustrations over food so greasy that they stain wooden tables. Steve doesn't have an agenda, she says half, half, half asleep. I have a fucking agenda. I want to help even, help even out some of the equality. I can't remember if she hit the table then. If she didn't, let's say she did. But I sat there thinking I was witnessing the terrible and wonderful. I have a fucking agenda. It felt like she'd reached into my body and plucked out a giant sticky ball with elastic bands from my body, and with it all the attention of the past, the past few years. I have a fucking agenda, I said silently over and over to myself. I have a fucking agenda. Everyone has a fucking agenda. I couldn't believe she said it so readily. But these are the sort of things that we whisper in our sleep, but we never really consciously actually like, want people to hear. And it was odd to hear, you know, it was odd to hear developers say that they want to transmit, to transmit themselves like that. Everyone at Rockstar Games used to talk about what the player wanted and enabling the player and making the player powerful. And I didn't really understand before that game makers could shape a culture or would want to shape a culture even. 
And I think this is when I knew that in bed with wasn't going to be a failure. I think that I knew then that I could kind of hold it down. And I think that I knew that I could get some sort of meaning from it. Um, this is Tim Rogers. I met Tim sometime in 2009, just before he left Tokyo, at a time where he existed as this kind of weird, pure internet entity that was somehow writing for Kotaku. And at that time, Tim was already an internet legend, um, sort of like an internet rumor that analyzed games so sharply and wrote his essays so rambling and emotive that people would sort of just turn up at his doorstep in Tokyo to pay homage to him. And almost every semi-famous tech writer I know has made the pilgrimage to Tim and had some sort of profound experience living in a strange world. Um, but my friend, the writer Patrick Miller, describes Tim as a social network. I still have no idea why I decided to go and see Tim all the way from my home in Kyushu, but I did when we had dinner. Tim mostly talked about making a Doctor Who video game, which he hasn't made, but he should make one. And by the time I left Tokyo, I still wasn't sure who Tim was or what he actually did. So I visited Tim in California to write about in March of this year, and I'm still not really sure who Tim is or what he actually does. One thing that I am sure of, though, is that Tim likes to be in control of things. So looking back on what I wrote about visiting Tim, who's making a video game called Video Ball, that was meant to be out months ago, I think, but um, I think it's coming out soon. It seems as if Video Ball is a game where control, the closeness of the player to their avatar, is of the utmost importance. Um, video Ball is a sports game, something that requires intense player skill and awareness of their environment. And the more I think about Video Ball, the more I think that Tim is making a game that is most like himself. In March, Tim's friend Stargaby drove us up to the Oakland Hills late at night, and the car was like winding up and up, and we were playing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 or Turtles in Time soundtrack, uh, loud, <laughs> and laughing even though none of us were drunk. Um, it was a really nice view up there. And I wrote about it. Tim and I were thrown around in the back with no seatbelts on, like bottle tops. In the bowels of a corkscrewing ship, Tim holding onto the umbilical cord of the wire that sends music from his iPhone to the car's sound system. He flaps it around. This is how I like to think about games, he says, indicating the new track he is feeding the speakers, waggling the line, the dash responding to his touch. Star Baby smacks the wheel. You should write that down, he yells at me. <laughs> Control is one thing, but the pattern knitted through all the embeddings is the, in the power of expression. Liz Ryerson used games as teaching tools, something that can demonstrate or intimate the difficulty of traversing worlds. She said to me, if you're trying to teach something by telling them something or writing it down, then that's one thing. But you're making a game to try and teach something and you put in text or you put in something explicit, you take something out of that experience. In a similar way, Nina Freeman in New York told me games are an important way of expressing herself and receiving validation in a way that she's comfortable with. The most rewarding way for me to explore that is unfortunately by having other people talk with me about it or having the awareness that other people are engaging with it, she said. Because then I am getting the sense of not being totally alone. My parents made me feel alone by brushing off everything that I was doing, and seeing people interact with the things I make and actually play it feels like they are actively engaged with what I'm trying to say. Girls are always told that they're crazy or their emotions aren't real, Nina says. They'll be like, oh, you're just saying that, or whatever. But people are always saying that to me, and I feel like maybe games are like, no, fuck you, I'm not crazy, this shit is real. In Malaysia, I asked Sean Beck who he makes games for. It's mostly for myself, Sean says immediately and definitely. In France, when I visited the developers of Catherine Neal and Harvey Smith, it became obvious that the French outlook to culture is encouraging and supportive to artists and creators. Harvey Smith, a known creator of Deus Ex, who is originally from the Gulf Coast, told me, the US makes it very easy to start businesses if you already have access to funds and all, but if you do really well, you keep all of the money. But on the other hand, the safety net and all the things that people in the U.S. see as a fundamental right are limited. It can be frustrating. I look at this like a game designer. If you looked at all the levers that you have in terms of a GDP, you could tweak it so that, all, that off the very high end you take some money and put it on the low end, so that everybody has a base subsistence. If you have sick, you get, you get taken care of, and if you're elderly, you get taken care of, or you might have a year of maternity leave. Things like that stabilize the society and enables people to take more risks. I'm living in France right now, and I'm working with a guy who took a few years off to be an actor, and eventually he ended up in video games. Now he draws from both of those fields. 
In France, it seemed to me that joy was a fundamental right, like shelter, food, and safety. But the real truth is that although France invests in culture and makes um, artists' lives easier and more comfortable, um, people will, will actually create things no matter what. Uh, cuts me sitting in a tiny Tokyo cubicle bar. Um, and that's a, a kind of picture, I don't know if it's, you can't really see it, but it's a picture of a, a very small bar in the Golden Guy area of Tokyo, which um, is very interesting, and I really recommend going to have a drink there. It's weird and wonderful and awesome. Um, so that's me sitting in a tiny uh, Tokyo cubicle bar with the maker of the Stanley Parable, David Reedon. We're talking about internet harassment and awful people of the internet. We're talking about how the atmosphere online has become hostile towards creators, particularly women creators. I say I'm thinking about leaving. I'm not sure I want to write or create in this environment. I'm grumpy as hell and I'm just whining about it. Why should we make things for awful people, I say to Davey over the wise. Davey shakes his head at me. I can't stop making things ever, he says. I just have to make. I just have to make things. I don't care who it's for. The internet has done a lot of things for us as creators. It's made our smallest projects able to reach others. It's made tools to make games really easily distributable. Kind people offer resources for free to let us express ourselves. But what it's done for game makers is truly enable them to make games for themselves and also be able to sell and survive on those games. Brandon Chung, for example, is making a very cinema-inspired house game, Quadrilateral Cowboy. Um, good turn it there. I'm talking to Brendan Chung when I was in LA. I was struck by how optimistic and how excited he was about the future of games. For me, it's not about where video games are right now, he says, reclining further into the Glitch City couch. More like what we could do with video games. We play these games right now and they do things, but it's that feeling. We're at that stage in film where you just see the train coming towards you and people are freaking out because they think they're going to be run over by the train. Just thinking about where we're going to be in 20 years, games are going to be freaking crazy. There's something about that that's really, really exciting. The last time I see David Reedon, we were drunk backstage at Tokyo Rosy Fun Cake. David tells me he's ready to leave the concert. I got what I wanted from this experience, he says to me. I got what I wanted. And that's what I think is so exciting about the era of games we're currently living in. They don't just have to be entertaining, fun, something good for a player. Because, because of the ways that games can be distributed over the internet or for free or for money these days, games can more than ever be an expression of a person, a voice, and a culture. The designers of games can take real ownership of games as a creative medium without feeling like they might not find a player who will understand it because there's a whole internet out there to play your work. Games are at such an exciting intersection where small experiences can be equally as valuable to people as a big blockbuster experience like Grand Theft Auto. When I look back at all the people I covered last year, I felt like they were being fulfilled creatively no matter what kind of game they were making. They were pushing the boundary of what games are not because they think a lot of themselves, but because they are less afraid than they used to be that they won't find someone who will like it. Adrian de Jong, who is talking today, uh, I think, or maybe tomorrow, made bound in with a ballet company because iOS motion controls are easy to interpret for people who have never played a game before. People like Ojiro Fumoto, who are covered in Tokyo, are pushing the boundaries because they are excited about what games can offer them. And people like Gwen Go, who are covered in Singapore, are bringing their personal kinks and tastes to their games because the internet has taught them that the personal is the universal. And the people who make games will become more important, not less important. There isn't one woman game maker I visited throughout my journey through Asia, Australia, Europe, or the USA that didn't mention Anne Anthropy's name as the inspiration to make something in game form. When I met the artist Marigold Bartlett, she's uh, pictured here in Melbourne, Australia, she told me that <laughs> she told me that when she found Anna's work, she knew she could make a game. Like Davy implied, Game makers are about getting what they want, and working on games that are meaningful expression, me, are meaningful expression to them personally is becoming part of that. They are taking ownership of who they are and how video games can express that. And that means that we have such an exciting year ahead for game makers and as game players, because no one can stop new voices being heard now. They'll multiply and multiply until everyone gets a game that's for them. It's inevitable, it's beautiful, and it's so fucking exciting. Uh, thank you for listening, and the game, uh, the book will be out soon, hopefully. So, thank you. I'm so, I'm so happy.
because it's like 30 minutes on the dot, and I timed it perfectly. Um, so I guess if you want to ask me questions, uh, you can go ahead. Yes. Um, there's a couple of game journalists who've already made the jump to development, like uh, Tom Francis and uh, Anthony Birch. You've already done Sacrilege, and you're programming a Drake-themed game, as you do. <laughs> so um, how's that going? Would you ever consider making the leap entirely to development? Yeah. Um, have you ever heard that amazing Ira Glass quotation about taste? Like, there's an Ira Glass, a wonderful Ira Glass quotation, which um, I think everyone should look up after this because it's such an inspiration. And it's basically, um, when you start out wanting to make something, you're not very good. And all that you've got is really, really good taste. And I feel like critics have that. Um, and you asked me, like, uh, critics making, uh, making the leap to um, development and, and whether I think about that. And I think, I think critics have an advantage in that they do spend their whole lives honing their taste and, um, and, you know, like, trying to figure out what it is they like and why they like it. And I think that puts you in really good stead to make a game. I don't think that critics necessarily... I don't think that most critics want to make games. Um, but occasionally... I think what happens is you see a gap for a game that you really want to play and it doesn't exist. And I think like most people start out that way, right? They, they make the game that they are not getting to play. Um, um, and I think if that sort of becomes, if it becomes obvious that, that there's a game that I really want to play that isn't being made, I think I'll make it. And I think I made Sacrilege for that reason. I wanted to play a game that was about uh, <laughs> I guess a horny woman, and so um, I made that game because I wanted to play it. So I think that I'll just have to wait until there's like a time in which I feel like there's a gap somewhere um, to make something. But yeah, I really like Tom Francis's Gunpoint. I think it's an excellent game. Um, and yeah, Anthony Birch as well is a fantastic writer. Um, although I think he's gone back to making videos for games now. But yeah, I think it's actually like a really, it stands you in really good stead to make games. I think it's definitely like, it's not easy obviously because you have to learn, learning to make games is difficult and I don't, I don't think saying that it's easy is helpful, but I think certainly tools like Twine like, like give you a kind of really nice structure in which to experiment with like simple things and then you can go on to like, you know, more heavy sort of scripting based stuff later. Um, so yeah, I'm learning C sharp just now, um, which is more difficult than Twine, let's say. But uh, it is actually very similar. In Twine. There are lots of things that I learned in Twine that I completely um, are, I'm entirely using. So yeah. Anyway, thank you for your question. Did I ask that question?